Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets, the second part of the online module for Lecture 7, which covers the capital asset pricing mod model. Okay, so what is the capital asset pricing model? It is an equilibrium argument that builds on the mutual fund theorem uh, that we've already uh, developed and then uses the beta representation theorem. So I'm going to make a number of assumptions. Uh, it's quite a long list, uh, but as, you, as you'll see, uh, one can obtain very powerful results with these assumptions. So let's assume that all investors take asset prices as given, so they're all small, they're, they're not uh, large enough to understand that they can manipulate prices with their demands. Let's assume that all investors care about returns measured over one period, that there are no non-traded assets, and investors can borrow or lend at a given risk-free interest rate. Now, this assumption can be relaxed, and we'll discuss that later. We're going to ignore taxes and transactions costs. We'll just assume that investors don't pay them. Uh, we'll assume that all investors are mean variance optimizers. We don't need a particular functional form, we're just assuming that they care about the mean and variance of asset returns. And finally, we're going to assume uh, homogeneous beliefs, that's to say all investors perceive the same means, variances, and covariances for returns. Now what does this long list of assumptions give us? It essentially implies that all investors are looking at the same mean standard deviation diagram and um, aiming to find uh, the highest available Sharpe ratio. And they're going to be able to do that by trading freely in, in assets. Okay, so this it delivers a certain homogeneity or sameness among investors, which is then going to give us uh, the, the, the key results of the CAPM. All right, now in order to state uh, the model, the, the main result of the model, we have to define the market portfolio. What do we mean by the market portfolio? This is a value-weighted index that contains all risky assets in proportion to their market value. So it's not just any value-weighted index. The S&P 500 is value-weighted, but it doesn't contain all risky assets. So the market portfolio is the ultimate broad index that includes everything and then value weights. Now the return on that market portfolio is written RM and it's given by the sum across all risky assets of the value of risky asset I compared to total value of all assets times the return on asset I. Okay. Now remember that in doing mean variance optimization we've been talking about an optimal risky portfolio P which is the mean variance efficient portfolio that contains only risky assets. And this risky portfolio P has a return RP, which is the sum of these weights WI, RI. Okay, now the, the theorem, the main result, is that the assumptions of the CAP M, which I talked you through two slides ago, imply two things. First, the mutual fund theorem. This, this we already know, really. All investors hold a combination of the risk-free asset, F, and the same risky portfolio, P. That implies that all investors hold the risky assets in the same proportion. So the total investment in risky asset, I, relative to risky asset, J, is always given by WI divided by WJ, where these Ws denote the shares of the assets in portfolio, P. That's the... First, the first piece of the theorem, and the second piece, which is the main result of the CAPM, is that in equilibrium, the market portfolio is the optimal risky portfolio. In other words, M is the same as P. Or, put another way, the market portfolio M is mean variance efficient. So if somebody asks you in one sentence, what does the CAPM say? It says that the market portfolio is mean variance efficient. Okay, now how are we going to prove that? Well, the first part is easy. The assumptions imply that all investors 
look at the same mean standard deviation diagram. They all hold a mean variance efficient portfolio. And since all efficient portfolios combine the risk-free asset with the optimal risky portfolio P, that's the mutual fund theorem, that means that all investors hold risky assets in the same proportions to one another. Okay, That means that the total investment in risky assets is in any risky asset from, any, from all investors together is proportional to their shares in P. All right, so each individual investor is holding risky assets in these proportions. So when we add them all up, the total investment by all investors in risky assets must also be proportional to their shares in P. Okay, so here's a graphical representation. Remember, this is standard deviation on the horizontal axis, mean return on the vertical, we have the risk-free rate down here. We have portfolio P here, which is on this uh, frontier. This is the best you can do with just risky assets. And then when you combine risky assets with the safe asset, we get this straight line. Any investor who's a mean variance optimizer looking at this picture will pick some point on the line. A more aggressive, a less risk-averse investor might be up here might have an indifference curve like this, which would imply a choice here. A more conservative investor will have this indifference curve, which will imply this choice down here. But all that is going on here is this investor is mixing P with cash, and this investor is leveraging, is borrowing cash in order to invest in P. So the relative holdings of different risky assets, whether you're here or down here, are always the same as in P. When we add up then, the relative weights of risky assets must all be the same as P. Okay, now let's think about the second part of the theorem, which is the main result. And it's really a very simple argument. In equilibrium, demand for assets must equal supply. The total investment that investors want to make in asset I must equal the market value of asset I. That's what it means to say demand equals supply. Now, this implies then that the total investment in asset I divided by the total investment in asset J will be VI divided by VJ. But from the first part of the theorem, which we were just discussing, we know that the left-hand side, this ratio here, equals WI over WJ. So putting it together for any pair of risky assets, we have that the ratio of the Ws is the same as the ratio of the Vs. Well, since portfolio weights sum up to 1, this also implies that the return on P, which is the sum of the Ws times the Ris, that has to be the sum of the Vs properly scaled, so that they add up to 1, the sum of the Vs times the Rs, which is just the return on the market. So portfolio P has return RP that's just the same as RM, so M is the same as P. Well, put another way, if we go back to this diagram here, this portfolio P actually is the market. The model is telling us that the market portfolio is plots exactly here, and it's mean variance efficient. It is, in fact, the unique portfolio that only has risky assets and is mean variance efficient. So here's a simplified figure. The cap M says that the Portfolio P, which is the same as the market, has the highest available Sharpe ratio. And the um, uh, we, we, we draw this um, capital market line, which connects the safe, the safe asset to the market portfolio. And that capital market line is the line on which all investors will invest. All right, so what's the intuition of this uh, model? The first part just says that uh, if people have the same beliefs, they're all mean variance optimizers, they're going to hold risky assets in the same proportion, and, and then that demand uh, will aggregate up. We can think about the total demand by all people uh, in the same proportions. And the second part, which is more subtle, says that in equilibrium, the relative share of assets in the portfolio demanded, the optimal portfolio will be the same as their relative market values. 
Okay, now this statement that demand equals supply in equilibrium, this, this may sound um, like, like magic or a magic trick. So let's, um, let's just uh, uh, give some intuition about what, would, what has to happen to establish this equilibrium. So imagine that some good news uh, arrives about asset I. And after this news, we re-estimate all the means and variances and do the optimization. And suppose that we find then that, that Wi over Wj is bigger than Vi over Vj. In other words, we now want to hold more of asset I because we expect it to have a higher mean than before or a lower variance. So we want to hold more of it and more of it than, uh, than the supply that exists. Well, what would happen then uh, to re-establish the equality? Well, there's two effects and they both go in the same direction. The first one is that because of this inequality that I wrote down, more dollars are chasing I than the value of shares of I. And that's going to put upwards pressure on the price of asset I. In other words, too many people are trying to buy it. So what will happen? VI, the market value of the company, will increase. As prices increase, then price times the number of shares goes up. But also, the second effect is that the increase in price will lower the expected return uh, because for any given cash flows, a higher price today means a lower expected return. Well, that will induce people to rethink and shift their risky asset allocation away from asset I. In other words, the desired WI will decrease. These two processes or forces, the increase in V and the decrease in W, will continue until the equilibrium is reestablished and the ratio of W's is the same as the ratio of V's. So finally, let's uh, note that the cap M implies a stronger form of the mutual fund theorem, because now we know the identity of both the efficient portfolios. All efficient portfolios are combinations of the risk-free asset and the market portfolio. So. All investors need are two mutual funds. One is a money market fund, the other is a market index fund. There's no need actually to perform mean variance analysis. Uh, if this model is true, any investor can free ride on the analyses of other investors and use the market portfolio as the optimal mutual fund of risky assets. In practice, passively managed funds indexed to the S&P 500 or better, a broader index such as the Wilshire 5000 or even a global index these are used as proxies for the market portfolio. And this logic that I've just talked you through is the basis for the frequent advice delivered by finance professors that investors should invest passively in these indexes and uh, combine them with, with cash or money market funds uh, as their preferences dictate. So that's where we'll stop for today. Thank you very much.